Barnes & Noble Union Square. Please give a warm welcome to New York Times best-selling author Sloan Crosley and host of Port Over Bannon's Mua Messer. Hi, thanks for coming. Wow, everyone. hi guys. I'm Miwa Messer, I'm the producer and host of Port Over, and it is my great good fortune to be sharing stage with Sloan Crosley tonight. You can, yeah. So, and here's the truth, we all know Sloan is the best-selling author of essay collections and a couple of novels, and now this, this new book that we're gonna get to in a second. I have to admit, I've known Sloan since she was in college. I met her before she even became a baby publicist. Friend of a friend kind of situation. And yeah, I hadn't thought about it until I was prepping for this show. I was like, well, I've always just known Sloane. And then I realized you hadn't even graduated yet. Yeah, I was a baby. It's like how oh, you yeah. always just, you don't remember when the first time you had ice cream. You just, it's just been there the whole time. How many of you have read Grief is for People? Oh my gosh. Yeah. I mean, the wow. book's been out for a couple of days, but... That's amazing. How many of you are scared to read Grief is for People? Yeah, that's fair. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I'm coming back to that with you. All right. So here's the thing. I've been noodling this prep for this interview more than I usually do, because obviously we're going to talk about big stuff, right? We can't not talk about big stuff, but I think... Part of talking about the big complicated stuff is also being able to be funny and you know, have that release valve at the back of your brain because otherwise we would all just be totally overwhelmed and miserable all the time. So I just wanna give you a little bit of a hi. We're gonna go in a lot of different directions tonight. And part of me is sitting here wondering if Russell would think it was tacky mm. if we start to laugh while we're talking about death and suicide and difficulty and grief. No, he okay. would think it was tacky if anyone has more of a comment. Oh. <laughs> do you know? Like he's, no, yeah, he's, I he's do. Not, I don't think so. I, think he's, I, th I don't think uh, many things were off limits for, for okay. him. Is anything off limits for you now that you've written this book? I mean, I, I should probably have gone over it backstage if it was. Uh, you know? You know, not the... Uh, no, all right, here's elective the Elective surgeries. Think, no, I think, I think you and I have a similar plan for what we're going to talk about here. But I feel like you were writing this concurrently with Cult Classic, your last novel. It feels like there's a lot of overlap mm -hmm. between the sort of middle to end of that novel and this entire project. Yes and no. I mean, okay. I think publishing moves a little more slowly than, mm -hmm. than people realize. Somewhere out here lurks my editor. <laughs> it might seem like I was working on them at the same time, but I was editing cult classic okay. while I was working on this book. So it's a different muscle. So okay. it's not like there was, you know, oh, now there's aliens in this book. You know, there, was no, there were no major shifts right. um, in either one of them. But at the same time, there are themes looking back at cult classic there's so much there's a the i think the strongest relationship in it is between this boss or a guy who used to be the boss of our mm -hmm. of our heroine and they have this sort of love-hate relationship right that's much more uh much spikier than mm -hmm. than my relationship with russell that was written when he was very much alive so i right. think i was noodling on our friendship and our relationship before anything had happened you have a line in Cult Classic where you say, death is the ultimate lubricant for truth. I do? Yeah, I found it yesterday. I didn't mean it. I know you didn't mean it. <laughs> I know you didn't mean it, but I'm going to rely on stuff that you have said in print. <laughs> I'm going to lean fiction. very heavily into stuff. Yes, it's fiction, but... But I yes, mean, I, said, I said death is the ultimate... Well, yeah, I mean, I think that I, I, now that, I don't know if that's true anymore. Okay, that's fair. I don't know if that's true anymore. I think that you still are, the idea of what you can, I guess what I meant was that you can say whatever you want, or right. maybe the character was thinking yeah. you can say whatever you want once someone dies mm -hmm. about them. I don't think that's necessarily true, and I don't think you necessarily get to know, regardless of, of what you emote um, mm -hmm. or what you sort of articulate, I don't think you get to know someone 
much better just because they died. You get to know, you can complete the one side of your friendship to your heart's content, you know, but you don't know them better necessarily. I remember when you told me that you were working on this book. This one. This one. I'm oh, sorry, it's a podcast. Yeah. I'm pointing at grief. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> There's also a video component, but... Oh, okay. I remember when you told me that you were writing it. And my first response was, of course, that makes perfect sense. Yeah, I remember that, actually. Yeah, it makes perfect sense that you're doing this. But then I thought, oh, it's going to be impossible. It's going to be really hard. I knew you'd figure it out. Because, because you knew him? Or? No, I... I didn't know Russell the way you knew Russell, but for you, I was thinking, this is, this is a lot. Yeah, but it's also the most common thing there is. <laughs> Death, birth, taxes. Seriously, I mean, I, but there is a, there, I mean, there is a way that the point of the story, of telling the story, mm -hmm. is to get very specific about him until you sort yeah. of dig a hold of the other side of the world and you come out the other side and it's a universal experience, you know? I mean, it's emotionally was not the easiest thing. Right. Cried a little bit. I mean, I still, there's still lines in the book that if I, that I hit like a snag and I'll, I'll get upset, which is funny because I would never tell you about the humor essays. I would never sit here with a straight right. face and look at you and be like, let me tell you which one of my jokes still make me laugh. Like never. But I some maybe I'm too new at this where like there are some lines that I'm like, okay. <laughs> okay, but I think we need to change the way we talk about death, dying, suicide, trauma, all of this. I think we need to change the language. And Tonight. I think, uh, you and I might not do that. I mean, we have aspired to change the world in many conversations, mostly over French fries, but I don't know if we're going to do that here. I just, as a human being yeah. who has seen lots of stuff, I would like to see us change well, the what way. do you... I mean, do you think we're too um, squeamish about it? Is that squeamish, the... standoffish. I think the humor piece gets yeah, swallowed. lost, swallowed, misinterpreted. I'm a Bostonian when we're not standing, or an ex-Bostonian, I should say, when we're not standing on hills smiting people, we make really inappropriate comments about a lot of things. And, you know, when you're surrounded by other Bostonians, you don't really have to translate yourself. And then you sit in front of a room full of people and you're like, ah, maybe I should, mm. Right. But I think when you come to New York, surely this is not the land of like the easily offended. Is it? Uh, I don't know what part of the city you're operating in. Maybe I well, think actually it might be because you work in corporate America. I no longer do. I'm just like this like free willing person who's like no one is responsible for me, um, and I'm not responsible for anyone. And it's really sort of you, I can say except outlandish for Mabel. Things. Yes, I do have a I mean, cat. Let's focus on it. <laughs> But you know what I mean, like I feel like, but I, but well, Russell was someone who said, I, I don't know, I keep saying that there were inappropriate things, but they just were correct. <laughs> they were just what everyone was thinking. So maybe that's what you're saying is that like, you know, that scrim of like stopping ourselves from saying what we really mean. But I feel like the thing is the reason why it's funny and the reason why his, mm -hmm. his death is not funny, but the reason why he's funny, he was mm -hmm. a very funny person. He was. And I keep people in other interviews prior to this one, you know, are, are quite serious about it. And I keep thinking, like, I wouldn't miss him. We wouldn't miss anybody if you missed them in one note, if you right. knew them in one note. Right. And so, yeah, he was very, I mean, do you want me to say some of the things that he's... You can say that, or do you want to read a little bit? Oh, I can read. But I, I, when we read, for, I don't know where to find inappropriate oh, things. Oh, no, why... Probably okay, I can just so, all right, flip in open that case, the... Tell the inappropriate story, and then you can... Okay, good. Oh, we have an itinerary. That's wonderful. Uh, okay, know. I love an itinerary. Okay. Uh, both of us are recovered publicists. I know, I, mean, I know. And I'm like, I'm like, yes, but when? Okay, so, yeah, a couple of inappropriate things. My favorite one that sticks out in my head, and what's weird is when you write something like this, you sort of go over the same ground again and again, and so there are other things that he said that's inappropriate that I just sort of keep for myself in my own private lockbox. But some of the stuff that's in the book is there was one day, one of my favorite things that he said, where my assistant, who used to dress rather sort of um, conservatively, but uh, with buttons that looked like they were kind of overworked, I mm -hmm. guess, <laughs> came into a conference room. We were in some sort of meeting, and Russell looked up at her and said, oh, my God, it's like you walked into Talbot's and said, give me the sluttiest thing you have. And I was like, oh, no, no. <laughs> No, 
And like I pulled, and this is way before me too, and I pulled her aside afterwards and I was like, hey, <laughs> if he ever says anything that bothers you, will you let me know? Mm. But the thing about Russell, and perhaps I should back it up for those mm. who have not read the book, he was my boss at uh, Vintage Books for 10 years. Uh, he worked in publishing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when people talk about having like a true passion for books, I always find it a bit, um, and maybe this is not the, the mm. house in which to say mm. this, but I find it a bit cheesy. I'm like, what does that mean? All of them? I don't like all of them. <laughs> like, but Russell really was an advocate for, you know, books that needed to be back in print right. um, and, you know, classics, all these things. What happens in the book broadly is that I am burglarized in 2019. I left the house for an hour. I had left to go get a hand x-ray, which means that I took off all my rings. Uh, and then I came back and found that all my jewelry was stolen. Someone had crawled in through my bedroom window and taken all my jewelry. And Russell was actually trying to help me solve this mystery when one month later to the hour, uh, he died by suicide, um, which I think we all know in this mm -hmm. room, yeah. but perhaps not in the podcast. So I thought I would clarify. So the bit I'm going to read you just to get, so you get a sense of the tone of the book is pretty early on and has nothing to do with anything. So enjoy. I wouldn't say nothing to do with... But no, but not the, some of the details yeah. I've just, I've yeah. just said. Well, actually, that's true. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's, it's a slim volume. Everything has something to do with <laughs> There's not that much wasted. Okay. In the days immediately following the burglary, I am a tragic figure among my friends, but in a fun way. Something real has happened to me, but not to my body. I am not maimed or consigned to a fatal disease. I'll live. Plus, I come bearing a mystery... One that can surely be solved right here, right now, over this shared appetizer. Amateur detectives, each friend is more convinced than the last that she will be the one to solve my case. The burglary is a brain teaser, a proposition shot up from a pistol. We had a book like this in our house growing up, a pop philosophy bestseller called The Book of Questions. The only question I remember verbatim is this one. You and someone you love deeply are placed in separate rooms, each with a button next to you. You each know that you will both be killed unless one of you presses the button in the next, next 60 minutes. You also know that the first to hit the button will save the other but die immediately. What would you do? Even if you give an answer that will absolutely result in divorce, the wording prevents you from being too cocky about murder. What would you do, not what do you do? In this same way, people are drawn to the, th to the burglary as a thought experiment, more than the burglary itself. Some point out that I have been the victim of a retro crime. Yes, I am aware that the 1970s came back to kick me in the face. Out of kindness or curiosity, they demand a tour of the story, but they aren't having any fun on the tour. They adopt the expressions of nurses exchanging furtive glances about the drip, Fine, then, I think. Tell me what to do. They advise me to do nothing, to write nothing, just to get some sleep and maybe install an alarm system. They mean well. But what they do not understand is that if I do not capture what I have lost, it will be like losing it twice. That's that. Thanks. A little baby, baby bit. So grief is for people, not stuff. But Russell was the kind of person who saw things as avatars. Yes, that's how I describe it in the uh, book. I mean, part of that is the connection. So you, you know, just so we all know that I'm of sound mind and body here, I understand that a suicide is worse than a burglary. So the suicide becomes, yes, as well, because they're, they're tied so much in the book, yeah. you know? And so, and he is also someone who mm -hmm. I think would sometimes get... <sighs> Not confused, but he just really, he was obsessed with the flea market. He was obsessed with things that were just older. I mean, it was baked into his job, right. which was at Vintage Books, which was getting things, as I said, back into print. Mm -hmm. This sort of archive that he was in charge of. Uh, he was obsessed with antiques, with old movies. He had read all of Trollope, all of Dickens. And it all seems wonderful, mm -hmm. you know? And it all seems like someone who just has a sense of history but then looking back on it now, with what I know now, it seems like he was really, really dwelling in right. that place. And he had, met, he had made, as I say in the book, mm -hmm. the dead more alive than the living. And I think he would agree 
with some of that mm -hmm. if, if he was if he was here. I mean, it's not like he he wasn't a social person, but right. it was different. But so I think when I talk about the objects being tied, he just was obsessed. He was obsessed with collecting things, mm -hmm. collecting things from the past. You know, I say that he wasn't a hoarder per se, but it sort of looked like it at times. Publishing was changing around him. His life was changing around him. The world was changing around him. I mean, obviously, Russell died before lockdown happened. Yes. He's one of the Which people. Which is one of those weird things. Right? I would not have thought. Before. I'm sure people here have had people die right before lockdown, and you're just like, if you only knew. Right. Yeah. I can't imagine he would have enjoyed it all that much, but I don't know. <laughs> I know that's a weird way. Listen, I know that's a weird way to phrase it. Did right? a lot of people enjoy it all that much? <laughs> uh, I know a couple of people who You're might really, have yeah. It. Well, no, it, yeah. But here's true. the thing. I mean, we're talking about grief on a global scale, right? Like, yeah, death happens. Suicide has happened. Like, how do we talk about grief? And again, here I am trying not to be flip about these things, but. I mean, Russell, come on, guy. Like, Wait, the question, the, so the question it's, is... It's a combination of, I wish he had been here to narrate yeah. 2020 and 2021. Sure. Like, I kind of, I wish I had those Instagram captions. <laughs> I wish I had that sort of Russell... But that's missing a specific person. I mean, there are other people that, I mean, I, I sometimes I think about, you know, Nora Ephron died right. almost exactly three years before Donald Trump announced his candidacy, and every once in a while, I'm just like, where is she? Mm -hmm. um, you know, doing triple sow cows in her grave. Um, yeah, I mean, he would have been up at the house probably with his partner, and because he was so, I describe him as sort of pathologically social, mm -hmm. I think he would have had a hard time with just hanging out with one person at a house that he... Mm -hmm hadn't lived in steadily for 20 years. You get used to it, he'd read. I don't know, I don't really think he would have had that hard a time with the, with the pandemic. I mean, no more than all of us did. You describe looking for your jewelry as becoming a hobby because you needed something to do mm. with the emotion and the, well, the anger. Oh, well, I suggest basically, that's funny. I was like, did I say that? Yeah, like, you did. But I said, I think what I said was basically that um, people were suggesting that I get a hobby. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, no, I have a hobby. And the hobby is being oh. psychotic. Okay. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm, psycho <laughs> I'm like, I don't need to it's play psychotic, badminton. I, but I, no, I, I know. Well, Not psychotic, but obsessive. Obsessive. I, I think, think obsessive is fair. I think, I think yeah. the thing is, is that what happened was, is that, you know, once Russell died, it was mm -hmm. like pouring, you know, gasoline on the fire of that hunt for the jewelry where I really mm -hmm. needed it. I needed to get it back. I would have done anything to get it back. And I am very aware that none of this jewelry belonged to the dead person in question. Right. So what does it matter? I mean, it matters for me because on a separate note, I'd like my stuff back. But, you know, that's not mm -hmm. exactly a deep thought. But the the intensity with which I approached that and how emotional it was, I think was sort of off the charts. But everything's conflated. I mean, why yeah, wouldn't it be conflated? It You're talking about like 30 days. It's so, 30 days. 30, 30 days. I mean, it's 30 days, almost to the hour. It is to the hour to the point where when it became, so it was June 27th mm -hmm. and then it was July 27th mm -hmm. and then when it was August 27th, I basically hid in a closet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like I don't want anything... Else bad. And then weirdly, this book came out on February 27th. It just, it's a strange, it's a strangeness. As a reader, I know you're not giving things equal weight. I'm watching yeah. you work things out on the page. And I trust, because I've read enough of your work and I've known you long enough, I trust that you know what you're saying is messy and imperfect. I mean, anyone who's yeah. read a single one of your essays, I remember the first time you were published in the Village Voice, and it was like, well, I locked myself out while the movers were showing up. And I'm like, yeah. oh, oh, <laughs> you wrote about that. You know, again, my first thought is, uh, yeah, that's not a, short, a story I'm sharing with people, but you have always done that hmm. in all of your work. And let's take the clasp out for a second. Let's take cult classic out for a second. Let's go back just to the essay collections. There may not be a ton of detail about your day-to-day -day life, but you are usually the first subject of the joke. Yeah. And 
I just, listening to you sort of say, well, I know, and I did it. I'm like, yeah, I trust you to know what you're figuring out, right? Like, the, the sort of weight of the thing. Sure, but I think that if you haven't read the book, that the whole of sort of import and magical thinking I mm-hmm. knew with the jewelry is, it, it, I think it does make sense within the book, but just mm-hmm. now in this moment, on, on, like while I'm talking to these, these fine people, it does sound a little bit like, well, here's two upsetting things that happen, even that sounds crazy. Do you know what I mean? They're, they're just, it just okay. conversationally. How many of you think... How oh, many, okay, hands. of the people who... No, no, I'm really curious. Of the people who have not read Grief is for People yet, how many of you are thinking, this is a little weird, what are they doing in front of us? I'm just... Uh, seriously, be honest for a second. Raise your hand if you think this is getting... Okay, there's one, two. <laughs> but no, but okay, so well, I guess I would say that with the other essay collections, mm-hmm. you're, you're, you brought up the Village Voice. Right. Um, I have never felt that... I was being sort of confessional or exposing. And I think it's possible that those three books uh, were sort of a, a bit of a training camp. Yeah. Um, you know, the three books of essays. Yeah. For this, in terms of the feeling of not, I don't think really when I'm, I'm very conscious when I, once I press print, when mm-hmm. I read a draft, that the most common vowel is I. <laughs> but I don't think I'm writing about myself when I do it. I think that I'm writing about something I have observed and it's sort of passing mm-hmm. okay. through me like that, not in a mystical way, but just in a very practical way, which is I'm, this is a first-person narrative account of something mm-hmm. I've experienced. And so the same thing is, is true for this, where I don't actually feel, I think there's maybe this impression that there's a lot that's like exposed. Mm-hmm. It doesn't feel like that to me. It feels like this is okay. the way to describe what happened. Okay, so how much of that comes in the initial draft? Because didn't you write... You started a draft, like, right early after Russell dies. Yeah? I, yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah. How far did you get before you sort of started, stepped back and said, hey, wait a minute, this is, this is me processing versus this is me putting out a book in the world? Oh, I... What is that timeline? <laughs> it's a, yeah, it's, okay. a, it's all over with the crying. Yeah, I, uh, I don't really process while I... It's, like, already... Okay. That's pre-done, and then when I write, I write for the book. Okay, all right. You know, I take notes not knowing where things will go, certain images, certain instances, but I don't actually have... You know, I once read some interview with Tina Fey where she was talking about why she didn't use Twitter, and yes, that's I'm not really putting myself in the ring with uh, Tina Fey, but I did relate to one thing she said where she was like, oh, no, I need my jokes. Right. I'm not workshopping (laughs) stuff. I need them. I don't know. Congratulations on being so terribly funny. I need what I have. <laughs> and I feel the same way where like not a lot comes out that isn't aimed at least at, at a finished book. Which doesn't make mean I don't mean to make it sound like I just sort of like pooped it out in this like perfect book shaped painful <laughs> object. I'm just I'm just saying this as slowly as possible so we really get the imagery in as much as we can. Oh. Oh, no, we've uh, got it. Oh, great. I promise you, so we've glad. got. I promise no, you, we've got. But there's the not that like feeling of like well, the thing I didn't know, which mm-hmm. is around a long way of answering your question. I yeah. think is that you know the burglary. Obviously, the book is chronological. The book takes place over the course of a year, because I find the my year of blank yeah. kind of cheesy. I think we avoided that in the marketing language, but it is pretty much June tw- 2019 to June right. 2020. So the burglary seemed like it might make for a doozy of an essay. If I, if, but even that, even at that scale, right. I was like, well, I don't know what the point is. I'm not just going to complain, so let me think. And then, um, unfortunately, usually the point comes before. Do you know mm-hmm. what I mean? You have an experience, and you then have all you think about your entire life and the things that you've been sort of ruminating on, mm-hmm. and then it matches the story. And unfortunately, this... The burglary. I was like, yeah, but I don't really know what it's about yet. Okay. And then what it was about fell very tragically in my lap a month later. And then gets built on even more before it sounds like you finished processing July. Yeah. Lockdown and everything. I mean, if I'm thinking about the, it's six months later, right? March when everything. Oh, the. Co- yeah, so yeah. there's so people should know without being too scared. There's mm. not that much hand hand sanitizer. There's like a little bit of toilet paper, but there is a COVID section of the book. It's not that long. It's really not. It's not that long. You're in, you're out. Uh, Actually, (laughs) I mean, in terms of the narrative, yes. Yes, you are. Yeah. 
it becomes bigger and bigger. It mm-hmm. was, you know, I don't know if it's as effective in the book as it was in my brain when I was writing it, but I had this idea of these concentric circles of loss. Right. That the burglary was minor, and then Russell is just one person, and then you have sort of the publishing industry and nostalgia for New York in the early aughts, and then you have, boom, COVID. Mm-hmm. But I think the effect of it is that it's never not Russell. You know, in my yeah. head, it was like these concentric circles getting bigger and bigger, like, you know, rings of Saturn. And in fact, it's just one big planet, which is him. Nora Ephron obviously was an influence for you as yeah. a writer. She you got have, me my job. Not yeah. really. No, but, seriously. You want to talk? Do you want to talk? Do you want to talk? such a weird thing to say. She got you. She's my best friend. Just kidding. We've never met. <laughs> I'm just going to say some stuff. No, I was thinking in terms of the the funny influence ha-ha part, but I want to talk about literary influences for a second because you do sort of gloss over, well, there was, here's the reading I did for the grief piece, right? There's Camus, there's Jessica Mitford, there's... Durkheim. Yeah. (laughs) Super fun. But as a humorous first, Mm. humorous first, novelist second, memoirist now in the mix, Mm -hmm. we'll see if you come back to this. Mm. I don't know. I Probably not. Literary influences. Well, never say never, y'all. Literary influences for a second. Where does it start? Oh, whoa. <laughs> We're sitting in a bookstore. I'm going to ask the question. Okay, you know okay, this. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's fair. That's fair. That's fair. <laughs> <laughs> never read. <laughs> um, I'm kidding. It's a joke. I know. <laughs> but I'm still going to give you the look because I can. The look, I know, I know. Okay. I mean, Lori Moore. Yep. I think part of Lori Moore, what I've always loved about her, or a lot of weirdly, um, there's uh, so many, you know, I don't know, uh, Don Powell. God, I, I don't even know where to begin. I mean, people who basically can write where they are, you feel this sort of intimacy, mm-hmm. and you feel this humor, and you feel that sort of humor of exasperation with them, that stuck in the middle with you quality. Mm-hmm. And then when you're not looking, they punch you in the stomach. And it's wonderful. <laughs> it's just like, that's a big one. Um, I mean, I can really go book by book. I think that I've, I've always had difficulty naming just like, mm-hmm. uh, broadly speaking, you know, uh, mm-hmm. a, a specific author. Um, Penelope Fitzgerald, I love her. I mean, I, I, mm-hmm. like there's lots of short, short stories where I would say more wildly influential to me early on. Mm-hmm. Maybe that explains the essays. Than, than novels and as a writer. Yeah. And not as a reader. I mean, as a reader, mm-hmm. you know, obviously that's not true. But for this book, I looked at A. Alvarez's, Alfred Alvarez's uh, The Savage God, which is about his, he was a poetry editor at the LRB and also very dear friends with Sylvia Plath. And so his deconstruction of suicide, which I actually quote a little bit in this book, I thought was actually fascinating and the most honest account but weirdly, tonally, the thing that I mm-hmm. hope this book matches yeah. the most that I've experienced, and unfortunately, the author's last name is real hard to say, but All My Puny Sorrows, which is by Miriam, is it Taves? Toes, I thought. What is it? If someone knows. Taves? Taves. Okay. Tweez? It's Tweez? Oh, that's so Canadian. Okay. Uh, she's, it's, it's All My Puny Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> She wrote Women Talking, which obviously mm-hmm. uh, was turned into a major motion picture and is quite heavy. Mm-hmm. But it's the All My Puny Sorrows is this, the darkness that you feel where her sister is in the hospital and mm-hmm. she feels like she can't save her sister who's making these repeated suicide attempts. And weirdly, it's funny that I brought up Laurie Moore because I think people like that are the only people here is also about yep. a, a mother, you know, whose kid has cancer, mm-hmm. who's, who's in this children's hospital. And the, the, it's hilarious and horrible. And I think, I, that's, I think that kind of tone is, is what I aspired to with this. You succeeded. But also for me as a reader, I need that. I need both sides. But I yeah. can't. But what are you reading that doesn't have it? I mean, that's the thing. Is I don't think I necessarily reinvented the wheel. The only no, thing that I, I think separates yeah. this book is mm-hmm. that it's suspenseful, which I think most stories of grief, we know how it ends. The ship sinks, you know? Mm-hmm. And this one you don't necessarily know, even though you know mm-hmm. one part. Yeah. But uh, most stories about grief, I think, are have humor in them, unless it's like, I don't know, like Rilke mm. writing letters. Mm. Sometimes no. I don't know. See, I, don't read too I, much, because then you read stuff that's not funny. <laughs> you don't want to do that. 
Sometimes we don't have a choice, dear. <laughs> All right, more importantly, I just realized I have questions in my lap. I'm so sorry. As you can tell, we could keep going for a while. But also, I'm curious about you guys, too. But anyway. With your last book being a work of fiction, how was the road back to working on a memoir? Were there things you picked up writing fiction that you had to shake off or a memoir headspace that you had to walk into? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, well, only because I've done it before. The okay, every yeah, other one, yeah. you know, like worth fiction. I there's a there's a collection of essays yeah. in between the two novels, yep. and so um, no, it wasn't. It didn't feel like a big shift. Advice <laughs> for aspiring essayists slash memoirists. Oh man, you have to find the balance between knowing that your story is incredibly valuable and not feeling like it's your story and writing about yourself. Mm -hmm. Feeling like you are speaking to somebody else. I don't know how people want to do that, if you want to pick a person or not. I think that's sort of dangerous. It's too, um, it's too much influence of one voice. Although I will say I've definitely done the thing where I pull out a page of a draft and imagine like a specific person reading it and cringe. Mm -hmm. Just because as an as a exercise in masochism. Yeah, so I feel like you have to find the balance between the confidence that this is a story that is worth telling. Right. But it is not just a diary entry. You know, I'm not just talking to myself. This will have an audience. And then ask yourself why. When you write memoir, are you concerned with getting the events exactly right, or is it okay to write the story just the way you remember it? Um, is it okay to tell the story? Just No, I mean, I think that there are... It's funny, because you'll see in the start of most memoirs or mm -hmm. most nonfiction, there's a nice little legal disclaimer <laughs> that's like timelines have been, been compressed, yeah, yeah, yeah. and not everyone was wearing that. Right. Yikes. You know, and that's true, but honestly, it's also, it's, it's a funny, weird thing that functions both as a the law mm -hmm. <laughs> and good advice for, right. for writers, you know, to, to know what you can mess with. But I think you know internally. Hopefully mm -hmm. you have ethics, you have some sort of internal clock that tells you what can be messed with and what is off limits. It feels like yours is very much a New York story and a vivid one. What other books with New York stories do you love? Oh my gosh. All of them. Um, I mean, there's a thing where, well, I should say that there's a disclaimer I make uh, in the book where I say that, you know, sometimes the story is not worth telling simply by virtue of where it took place. Right. <laughs> and that we tell ourselves you know, that everything is so spectacular because we sort of managed to, what, live through walking down Delancey? Like, <laughs> here's your medal, you uh, know? Listen, my dry cleaner's been in the same place for 30 years. I, mm, You know what I mean? Mm. But, like, a lot of stuff, like, we're like, oh, this, like, crazy, meet right. cute thing. Like, only in New York. I'm like, a lot of shit happens in Minneapolis. Like, it's not <laughs> that crazy. But they're, the New York stories that seem specific to me tend to be the time period ones. Yeah. So, go tell it to the mountain. Mm-hmm. Again, Don Powell, uh, Rachel Kushner, anything by her. I don't, it's really hard to abstractly think mm -hmm. of them all. I mean, I, I don't know. I loved American Psycho. I mean, and it's all, it's so hard, but there's so many books that you don't think of as, as taking place in New York, but they do. I hadn't heard Don Powell's name until you mentioned her. I that, love her. Yeah, it's, I love and her it's been a while. She was a Russell person because mm -hmm. that was the thing, the forgotten person. Like yeah. Russell helped get Stoner by John Williams yeah. back into print. He got Haywire back mm -hmm. into print. He noticed, or even in a more sort of contemporary fashion, he noticed that it was the 50th anniversary of Chinua Achebe's Things Fall Apart, that the rights were up. Yeah. He got Vintage to put it back into print, and then he had an event at Town Hall where Chinua Achebe was still alive, and... He's like, I'm just going to invite some people to speak. Okay. So next thing you know, it's Toni Morrison, mm -hmm. uh, Chimamanda Adichie, Chris yep. Abani, yep. Hajin, like a duck, a priest, a nun. Like, yeah. like everybody walking across the stage. And they sold out. They, they, sold, they sold out, out town, town halls. Hall. Thousands and thousands of people. Right. Like, right. And I that's mean, because he noticed. Mm -hmm. So it's like a lot of the stuff that I feel like is in this book is a tribute to him, but the advice I just gave, you know, a hypothetical or a mythical mm -hmm. young author of like figure out how it's not totally about you or figure out what else it is, is like, yes, this is a story about my friendship with this person. This is also a tribute to like anybody who's worked or known anyone who's worked behind the scenes in the arts. Mm -hmm. He didn't get an obituary. And I like to joke that I got, you know, 200 pages worth of real pissed. <laughs> that he didn't get an obituary. Right. 
You saw your first ghost when you were nine. You've been waiting oh to God, see a ghost ever I since. Say that? <laughs> yeah. See, this is kind of fun when you read this closely and you get to throw lines back at the person who wrote them. When because we're I... just sticking to the text. Actually, you. Won't... It was when you went to see that apartment, the giant loft. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. That was it's haunted, in... though. Yeah, that it's... was haunted with the ghosts of, of dead um, sex workers. Which yeah, was and the woman who was living there did not want yeah, you yeah, to yeah, tell that's her right. that. Okay, yeah, I went to see an apartment where it was. It used to be a brothel. It was at um, two ninety five, three ninety five. The Bowery. It was called McCurk's Suicide mm-hmm. Hall. Yeah. The things you learn when you go back. Apartment into shopping. And granted, right. it had been a minute. Yeah. Since I had read, how did you get this number? But you still waiting to see ghosts? Or are you good now? <laughs> I'm good. Yeah. I'm good. The stuff, the thing is, there is a little bit that I hadn't really realized for someone who I think hopefully is quite transparently not mm-hmm. very um, woo woo. I'm not yeah. a fir- person who believes in anything. Um, <laughs> I don't believe, no, you believe in the power of words, you believe in the power yeah, of story, sure, you believe sure, in the sure. joke to say. I believe in a lot of earthly things, yes. a lot of parallel earthly things. Earthly things are okay. Yeah, but I think that there were there are certain strangenesses with this book that I couldn't help but notice um, that were highlighted by, by grieving. You know, you're mm-hmm. looking for signs, you're looking for the person you lost or the things you've lost. So things become significant. You know, I was wearing the same clothing Mm -hmm. on the day of the burglary as I was when the last night I saw Russell, which was three nights prior. Mm -hmm. uh, And I just, you know, threw it down the garbage chute. I think, you know, there's like certain things. Three nights ago, Mm I, this is very detailed for everyone and I'm sure exactly what you came for. I went to get my nails done and there was no one else in the place except for Mm -hmm. me and a couple of women who were working there, one of whom had a tiny little sort of mangy dog that had one of those like, don't lick the stitches colors mm-hmm. and I was just making conversation it's not like I overheard the dog's name I was just like oh what's the dog's name and she said Russell it just sort of then sort of looked at me you know with like the teeth missing and one tongue it was like <laughs> 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 and I'm like yeah that tracks and but, but the thing is what, what like what do I think that is that is a right. coincidence yeah do you know, I don't think that's the ghost of Russell through this dog. No, it probably it wasn't, does not I, have I, its charm. I did see the photo on your Instagram. I was not thinking ghost of Russell. But yeah, but it's just like this, there's things that are, that you just notice a little more. Mm-hmm. I mean, the big thing, if I can take it back to something a little more yeah. serious, is the big thing to notice a little more that has like changed for me after this book is I listen to people differently who I feel like might be in pain or upset. Mm -hmm. Like this has broadened my experience on this this earth in a way that I absolutely did not need. I was fine. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Without this bonus round, and I'm sure there will be others. That's how it's, I I look at things a little bit more differently, but I don't think that I believe in ghosts more than I did. I don't think you do either. I was just hoping that I would get you to say, what in the that world did I say? say well, no, I just really because I mean you sometimes answer that, Fred. <laughs> no, because sometimes it, no, because sometimes it's just fun digging back in the early yeah. stuff. Yeah, right, and watching the evolution. Yeah, of course. Of a writer, because sometimes too, I look back on it and I'm like, how have you been writing for as long as you've been writing? Like, well, you've just been get doing gather around children. <laughs> <laughs> That's my walker parked next to hers. Okay. Yeah, I published my first piece in 2004. In the Village Voice, which I really miss. In the Village Voice, yeah. I published my first piece in the Village Voice. I had published a couple of pieces before that that were uncredited, that were like local restaurant reviews for uh, Black Book. Had a series of city guides. Oh, I forgot about that magazine. Yeah, well, Ooh. remember. No, no. <laughs> I would like to not. Thank you very much. Yeah. Shoot. I just want to talk about the evolution of your voice, though, before we get to the book signing piece of it. I no, it is a big question, but I feel like, and also, I've been sitting very closely with a lot of your work for the last few weeks, and maybe I'm seeing it more than some. But I do feel like there has been an evolution and a little more sense of play, which is going to sound really counterintuitive because we're talking about a book about grief. But I do feel like you're a little looser on the page now than you were certainly with like how did you get this number and right. I thought there would be cake I'm probably not imitating other people okay I think that's what happens with everybody okay. you know that's my guess is there's a certain formality mm-hmm. in the essays like humor essays of the 90s right. let's say so you have David Sedaris David mm-hmm. Rakoff who's a wonderful 
uh, mm-hmm. golden god of a man who's no longer with us. But then even like Bill Bryson, Chuck Klosterman, mm-hmm. um, Megan Dom, you know, who wrote about her hatred of wall-to-wall carpet for The New Yorker. Mm-hmm. And the reason she got away with that, in addition to being a talented writer, is because it's so formal. And so I think that there's a formality mm-hmm. to those essays. But I think things have gotten a little too loose in general in this world. <laughs> I'm not sure I agree oh, with you. I'm on like that, a little. But that's like, a whole different that's show. That's a whole different show. But a little too. A little, I'm like. I, that's a little bit like. I, it was meant to sound, hopefully, as it did, which is like a little too. You know, when I was your age, I used to have to walk uphill both ways to school. But like a little too, just so you can't just spit everything out and and right. press print. I think it would be nice if there was craft. Yeah, a little bit of craft, I suppose. Mm-hmm. But I think that maybe. I don't know, it's like anything else. It's like painting, it's like music or anything I think a lot of the people in this audience do for mm-hmm. a living where you get not necessarily good enough at right. it but comfortable enough that you, A, you need to entertain yourself if this is going to be what you're doing and then you also get comfortable enough to know the rules to break them without sounding like you don't know what you're doing. Fair Hopefully. Enough. We'll find out. So what's next? I'm going to sign books. I know you're going to sign books. Does that mean we haven't decided on what the next project is? <laughs> She's totally, totally, totally ignoring me right now. But. Um, no, I've, I've uh, some things I'm noodling with, but they're all sort of in the okay. zygote stage. They cannot be described. All right, that's fair. That's totally fair because you know we'll just do this again. We'll just do it again. They we'll divide us. I mean, seriously, we keep doing this every time you have a book. It's really nice. Oh, well, I mean, it's a lovely to talk to you. I mean, it's true. You've known. I mean, I think that one of the the lovely things about this book, just before we wrap up, to mm-hmm. talk about the person in it, is to just say that he worked behind the scenes in a world that I worry sometimes sounds insular with the book, right. but the truth is, is that in the process of just walking around, you know. You knew him. Right. A lot of people knew him. There's a lot of, um, there's sort of a meta thing to promoting the book with people he knew at places where he's been. Mm-hmm. Um, and so when it comes to ghosts, I would say that's the closest I get is retracing his steps now. Yeah. I think those are good ghosts. Yeah. I think those are really good ghosts. And I'm going to thank all of you for joining us tonight. If thank you. Can you. Hang out. Thank you for coming. Thank you for listening. Poured Over is a Barnes & Noble production. To help other readers find us, please rate and review the show wherever you listen to podcasts.